You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast, and I have Gunther with me. He's a philosopher specialized in the philosophy of science, philosophy of language, communication, philosophy of biology. In the late 1980s, he proposed the concept of life as a communicative structure. Cells, tissues, organs, and organisms uh, organize and communicate through uh, processes and you know, sign-mediated interactions. And so we're going to talk about that biology and evolution and all those good things. So, Gunther, thank you for being here. Fine. Yeah. So, tell me about uh, what are you interested in in the world of biology and evolution and why? How, what, what made you interested in this for so long? Yes. Um, I, my expertise is philosophy of language hmm. originally. originally. And... Um, then I read in the 90s of the last century, I read uh, a lot of uh, biological papers and uh, so they use uh, many terms out of uh, language, science or linguistics, such as cell-cell communication or uh, genetic code, transcription, tra- translation and so on. Mm. And then I investigated how they found and justified their terms, and I had to notice that in biology they used these terms in a rather outdated version. Oh. They used communication and language in a mechanistic way, uh, convinced that you can explain language and communication by mechanistic terms. Sure. This is not correct. This is clearly an error because the philosophy of science had a 60 years old discussion and this discussion has a result. And the result is you can't catch communication or language in a mechanistic way. This Are you- is uh, in- impossible to catch these terms mechanistically because in language you have a superficial uh, grammar for example but also a deep grammar uh, and with mechanistic approaches you can you can catch the superficial grammar mm. but not the deep grammar well with language there's also intonation and then there's um i mean there's a whole bunch of things you can uh you can allude to something. Uh, language, I guess, is very sophisticated and has many levels of communication, right? Yes, in every communication, you need some sign system uh, to transport what you want to utter or to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is clearly uh, the result of this discussion that you have three levels in every kind of language. And this is the grammar, uh, how to combine the single signs to a longer sequence, of, like in our sentence, uh, talk now, you need the correct grammar, otherwise you, we stand each other. So, then we have to transport something, some content, which means this is semantics, the meaning of the signs we use. Mm. So, so, and re- level of rules, in language is pragmatics. This was forgotten, forgotten by most uh, biological disciplines if they speak about natural language or code, because pragmatics means 
that there must be a sign user or a sign using agent which is interwoven in a concrete life world and the context in which this sign user is involved decides about the meaning, not the semantics, not the grammar. So in biology always, if you have a natural code, like the genetic code, for instance, uh, it was long the conviction if you have the grammar of the nucleotide sequence, you have the meaning. Okay. But this is, an, this is an error. It needs the context in which the sign sequence is used, which decides its meaning. So we can see this at epigenetics. We have the same and identical DNA code for some gene or gene regulation. But the methylation or histone modifications, the epigenetic markings, decides how DNA is transcript, is transcribed and translates into proteins. So you have the possibility okay. that you have an identical code, but depending on the context, it is a different translation into proteins. So you have uh, the same code, but you may have a variety of different proteins as a result out of this. It depends on the context. This was okay. Forget. So epigenetics changes the context in which the DNA. Well, epigenetics is affected by our environment, which is the context in which we live, and that affects how DNA is read and transcribed. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, got it. And then um, a big question that comes to mind is, does um, language require intelligence? Coding, decoding, creation of a code. What, what are your beliefs there? Yes, I, uh, with my studies and my expertise in the early 90s, it was clear that the assumptions of biology, that genetic code is the result of error replication and natural selection of a variety of errors is not correct because there is no natural language and there is no natural code which speaks itself or code itself. There are always, in all empirical uh, investigations we know, uh, there are competent sign users which you speak a language or which code a code. So the assumption that there is a natural code like gen genetic code is a, a, the result of errors and uh, the selection of uh, a variety of errors uh, cannot be uh, correct. So I'm, I searched for agents which are able to edit this code, mm. to arrange nucleotide sequences, who change uh, nucleotide sequences in living organisms, and uh, as a result for evolutionary novelties and uh, genomic variation. I searched uh, nearly 20 years for this, but I did not find my agents. Huh. And then 2005, I read a book from avant-garde virologist Luis Villarreal from Irvine University, okay. California. And this book was Viruses and the Evolution of Life. And he, in very detailed way explained how viruses determine cellular life in all stages of its life. And so I was very excited because now I found my agents which edit code. And as Villarreal proved, uh, the main life motive for life of viruses is not disease causing huh. or the bad uh, disease uh, agents which uh, are damage whole societies through disease, but the most prominent and most uh, actual motive of viruses to live is to infect organisms and to install themselves in the genetic code of the host organism. And he called it, this is persistent. They persist huh. in the in the organism. So we have, for example, in so, uh, human genetic code, uh, nearly 20,000 persistent viruses, really? which are constantly integrated, not most, most of them not uh, 
cannot be replicated because they are only parts of the former viruses, hmm. uh, infection agents, but parts of viruses now are adapted and now serve as regulatory tools for the host to regulate his gene expression, his replication, his immune system, most prominently the most immune systems uh, also of prokaryotes and eukaryotes are from for, former viral infections that now got persistent status mm. and so help cellular organisms to defend themselves against invading parasites and uh, have uh, possibilities to change their genome actively if adaption processes are necessary. So this was That's really amazing. exciting. So viruses, uh, you can see them wearing a shirt that, with the crown on it that says keep calm and infect on. You know, they have, These uh, are only those that are not able to uh, persistently invade a host organism. So you you're saying the the whole purpose of viruses is to integrate with the DNA of other organisms so they can continue yes, this is the, the main purpose of viruses it's a hmm. infectious genetic parasite and the most prominent motive of viruses is to infect and to install themselves at themselves into the host organism uh, in most cases uh, it's not one virus but the viral hmm. clouds you must if you take one drop of seawater, you have one million bacteria, but mm. ten times more viruses. So if we go swimming in the sea, we are swimming in a soup of viruses. They don't harm us. They don't do anything to us because we have a strong immune system. But some uh, integrate and help to uh, strengthen the immune system and also competing viral clouds uh, try to integrate in host organisms. And then the exciting thing occurs, the competing viral clouds who want to, to infect the host organism are somehow counterbalanced by the immune system. And this counterbalance invading parasites, genetic parasites, now can integrate into the host organism as counter-regulation systems. If, if they are integrated as counter-regulating persistent viruses, we have very much regulations in our genome as any other living organism. And normally the counter-regulation functions very well, but if you have some disease or some infect or you, are, you have a bad cold or so, or even in cancer, this counter-regulation can get out of control and one side now is too strong and not counter-regulated by the other side. And so most of the diseases we know are out of control counter-regulations hmm. in this sense. So um, what, are, what are some examples of viruses that have integrated into our genetics as humans and what functions do they serve? Yes. For instance, uh, we have a lot of retroviruses integrated in our cells, and one of the most prominent, uh, is for sure, is the syncytin gene, which cares that the trophoblast, the, the, this is the embryo of, um, in mammals, if the trophoblast uh, cell has a membrane, and this membrane is uh, regulated by this syncytin gene, which derived from retroviral viral infections. And this syncytin gene cares that the embryo is not identified by the immune system of the mother mm. as foreign. So if the syncytin gene is, is, uh, is red and replicated, the embryo is under, is sure not to be recognized by the immune system of the mother. And as long as the syncytin gene is uh, replicated, uh, the embryo is uh, carefully protected. Mm. And after the, uh, uh, the embryo is old enough, then the replication of the syncytin gene is stopped, and, uh, but this doesn't matter because the immune system of the mother uh, is uh, now uh, suppressed. 
suppressed and the embryo can grow up. So this is one example, the Sun Chi Ting Yin. But there are an, a lot of other uh, things like the ARC gene, R-I-R-C, okay. the ARC gene, which cares for synapse uh, communication and the uh, cognitive uh, capabilities of uh, brain uh, mammals with, brain, with big brains, like our relatives, the great chimpanzees or so. And this ARC gene is responsible for cognitive uh, uh, capabilities. So if this is uh, correctly transcribed and translated, the ARC gene, which also derives from a retroviral infection, then the cognitive capabilities can grow and develop. Okay, interesting. Another example we now can look at is like the uh, HIV uh, virus. HIV? Uh, HIV, we are virus, uh, which is very dangerous now and, and kills many people, still kills many people. But some few people are immune against this. And we have indicators that in these few people, this RIV virus is integrated persistently. And if they reproduce, uh, nobody will become ill, but if they uh, reproduce with non with, with people which have not, doesn't uh, have this protection, then uh, this disease can become virulent and dangerous again. Mm. So the population of humans which have this virus integrated uh, won't become a disease, but if they mix with uh, non integrated uh, members, then the disease will go ahead. So viruses want to change their hosts and insert their DNA, and then they also want to protect against other viruses getting in there and disrupting what they've done. Yes. Huh. So uh, going back to an earlier question, and I'll broaden it, do you believe that a mind or intelligence is required to create a code and do you believe that all creatures that are alive have some sense of purpose or self, even a virus? Uh, for in, uh, I don't uh, think that we must uh, need some terms like mind or conscious, which edit this code, because uh, also the virus depend on RNA networks, and RNA networks, mm. uh, the communication of RNA networks serves uh, that uh, viruses can constitute and together with viruses the RNA networks are integrated into cellular organisms and uh, these three levels, RNA networks, viruses and cellular organisms have different communication levels but they are complementary. So if we look at life as we know it here in our planet, we have these three levels of communication, RNA networks, viruses, and cellular organisms, which depend on each other. So they uh, clearly can edit genetic code, uh, RNA networks, in every cellular process, cells, tissues, organs, and organisms. The key uh, replication or transcription, translation, epigenetic markings, immune systems, even repair systems depend on these RNAs. So the new perspective is to look at DNA just as a house, and the RNAs are the inhabitants. They are active. DNA is mm. not active. DNA is a rather stable information storage, uh, an evolutionary archive. Uh, but uh, who are the, or the what are the agents that uh, live out of this archive? For the host, it's the RNAs. The RNAs in every process of cellular life really plays key roles. So how do you think uh, life began? Yes, life began. And this is the concept uh, Luis Villarreal and, and me, myself, uh, we wrote uh, some articles about this. Life is constituted and started with uh, 
this is very interesting. They started as a genetic code in the RNA world. Uh, there was uh, some investigations uh, some years ago, and they found if you have a, a RNA stem loop, as, as the stem is a double-stranded RNA and the loop uh, mm. is a single-stranded RNA. If you have one so a RNA stem loop, this uh, functions only in a physical chemical way. It reacts only in a physical chemical way, constantly following natural laws. But if you have a group of such RNA stem loops, then interestingly, biological selection starts. Hmm. So uh, life, for my in my perspective, started with group interactions group communication of RNA stem loops, because then biological selection starts, and this is uh, not possible on abiotic planets, that biological selection starts. This is only with these uh, couples, couples, and the density of RNA stem loops. And then they, they could build groups, and uh, they had uh, no stable information storage, but constantly changed in a very dense way. The, the oceans were full of these RNAs. And then is the question, what starts then? Viruses or cells? There's a discussion and a discourse in the competing concepts, whether viruses came first or cells came first. But it is clear that most viruses uh, serve or have genetic sequences which cannot be found in cellular life. So this is an indicator that viruses are older than cellular life. Personally, I think that viruses and cellular life may be started together, but the roots of viruses clearly relate to the old RNA world and therefore is older than cellular life, even if hmm. viruses and cells emerged at, in parallel. So what um, do you think that life is an emergent property of naturally forming RNA that came together in groups? Yes, for sure. Because if you you have the single RNA stem loop, it uh, it, it reacts only in a physical chemical way. But if uh, you have a, a group of RNA stem loops, then biological selection starts, and the genetic code, which is absent on abiotic planet starts to work in in their interaction modus. They constantly interact with their loops because they are single-stranded and are binding prone to meet other loops and can build groups that uh, represent a kind of early genetic identity. And this identity is able to, uh, to differentiate between self and non-self. Integrate, if you answer RNA stem loop group, meets another RNA stem loop, it may identify, does this fit to us? Can we integrate it or not? Must we, uh, do we reject? And, and so self and non-self differentiation, which is clearly a property also of viruses, and later on of cellular organisms uh, starts here with the genetic identity of such groups. And not to forget, RNA stem loops constantly invade other RNA stem loops. So if one, is, one group is weak, it is occupied and manipulated uh, immediately by one. And the remaining single parts, uh, which are rejected in later times and under changing circumstances, uh, may fit. In a, in a later phase, and may be in a later time integrated into cells or rejected from an integrated one. So this is very dynamic, and this very dynamic life of RNAs was not on the focus on former pictures of life. Uh, essentially. Are there any um, lab experiments where people have taken various RNA? and put it together in a dish and see if the RNAs interact and start to uh, change over time? Has that been observed? Yes, there are a lot of papers and Villarreal and, and myself 
in our articles, we, we took this in our references, and also in the meetings I organized uh, in 2008, Natural Genetic Engineering and Natural Genome Editing, or 2014 was uh, DNA Habitats and their RNA Inhabitants, and last year we had Evolution Genetic Novelty Genomic Variations by RNA Networks and Viruses, this was the third Congress, and the proceedings are published uh, at the New York Academy of Sciences in the annals. So people have taken RNA put it in a dish or a culture or a medium, and they've seen it interact with other RNA and changed it? Yes. What kind of interactions did they see, and you know, how long did it take for interactions to happen? Uh, the, in very detailed work, many uh, groups uh, did research on this, and they identified even uh, how the tRNAs, which in the ribosome care for translation of the messenger RNA into the amino acids, they found that the tRNA is derived from two different parts from former, which were invented or, or emerged for different purposes, not for translation into amino acids, but when they got this final form of a tRNA, transfer RNA, then they were able to to bind uh, in this exciting process with their triplet code, uh, the amino acid code, and to produce protein. Hmm. So the, these uh, researchers in RNAs, uh, most prominently by Tom Czech, who got the Nobel Prize for this RNA world hypothesis, and now uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of groups which uh, do only research how RNAs communicate and interact with each other and what properties they have. There is no mind and no consciousness, but there is their competence to bind to other RNAs uh, and uh, produce biological selection processes. So RNA, you said there is no consciousness, there is no mind in RNA. No. What about in a virus? What about in a bacteria? What about in a uh, invertebrate? You know, what, at what point does it start? Well, if you... Uh, uh, there is no consciousness, no, but there is still life, and life depends on is it able to communicate together, to coordinate. So one of my main purposes or premises of my books is that living nature as a whole is organized and coordinated by communication processes. So if if you look at any cellular process, you in li in cellular organisms, there must be coordination and organization mm. uh, between organs, between tissues, within the tissues, within the cells, within the organisms. And these are all communication processes clearly identified uh, as such. And if these communication processes function, then the organism, the tissue or the organ has no prom problem and functions as it is necessary for the whole organism. But if these communication processes are disturbed by something outside of the organism or inside the organism, then the communication comes out of control and this communication disturbance occurs, then disease may be the, the result. So this is life. Well, but why, why do we have consciousness then? What, why do we need consciousness if life can work without it. Uh, we have uh, we are a, a single event in life with our conscious, but we we have uh, yeah, consciousness is a difficult uh, term. Consciousness is uh, we can find also in primates. They have uh, a language that is not the same like ours, and they are not uh, self-reflective but they can uh, still communicate in a very differentiated way. Also the cetaceans, the dolphins, the, the whales, hmm. and also some birds have uh, strong cognitive abilities. Uh, different to humans, but without no doubt on a high level, uh, depending on social communication processes. So we can go down now to bacteria. Uh, bacteria in groups like uh, can also uh, have very uh, 
differentiated communication processes, so they form communities like the biofilm. You all you know the biofilm. Right. If you have a cold in the nose, you know the biofilm. And if you take the human uh, oral whole, there are 500 different uh, um, kinds of, or, uh, of bacteria, and they have all to communicate with each other to get a constant equilibrium in the mouth hole. Otherwise, we get a, a mouth uh, disease on the mouth hole. Hmm. So if there is some organization and some coordination in living nature, you need a communication process which functions. If the communication doesn't function, you, can co you can't coordinate common goals, for instance. Right. But you don't think that a mind created RNA or DNA. You just think it emerged out of... I, I don't know this, but uh, a, a mind is not necessary to explain uh, how RNAs, viruses, or cells live. Hmm. They well, can't do it by themselves. They are competent to use science and communication processes. That's enough. Hmm. Communication processes is, have an as inherent uh, feature has they want to function. A communication process wants to be successful. And uh, otherwise you can't coordinate common goals or common behavior like in bacteria or in single cell eukaryotes or in fungi or in plants. Right? Uh, the difference between animals and plants is that the communication in plants is uh, not so slow because it's not electrical. It's only on chemical ways. Mm. But uh, they have properties which is more than in animals. Uh, plants can communicate on five different levels in parallel. Hmm. It's impossible for animals. They have a central nervous system. They have uh, the brain organ. The brain hmm. organ says what the organism has, has to do. In plants, they have a decentralized communication processes and therefore can be able uh, to communicate on different levels in parallel. So this is uh, for a sessile organism necessary because it can't run away. But if a plant uh, mentions a dog uh, running around him, uh, if the plant could think, she would wonder what is doing this dog here. He's yeah. running away. So. It's eating my leaves. And, yeah. <laughs> it's peeing on me. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so what? What is the latest thing that you are working on? What is what new topic is fascinating you, and what are you working on? Uh, now I'm uh, I got a contract with, uh, with my publishing house, and I will edit then as next of my books. The last in the series is biocommunication of fakes. Biocommunication of fakes. These are the fakes are the viruses that only infect bacteria, and you know uh, half of the bacteria of the world die through fake infection every day. Uh, the reason why bacteria still are alive because they are very fast in reproduction. So also the fake therapy is an important step which will uh, last the next decades because the multi-resistant uh, uh, disease-causing bacteria now in the, as a result of uh, multiple use of antibiotics Mm. now causes these multi-resistant uh, microbes and fake therapy which only kill bacteria is now the leading field to, to catch these uh, multi-resistant microbes and to help humans to avoid uh, dangerous oh. times. In this do, do phages eat bacteria and viruses or just bacteria? Uh, uh, phages are viruses. Oh, okay. Kind of specialized viruses, and they only uh, only catch bacteria. They are specialized on bacteria, so huh. they are they are all they are also uh, co-evolved with bacteria. So bacteria try to to escape uh, fake infections by changing their immune systems, and um, especially the CRISPR-Cas. Uh, system which mm. is now under investigation is a result of how um, 
bacteria integrate former infection events of uh, phage into their genome that uh, to update their immune system to faster react against invasion. So do phages do the same thing with bacteria as they do with us? Do they try to infect bacteria so that their RNA will be incorporated into the bacteria? Do they have the same goals as regular viruses? Yes, the viruses is an effect, an effective agent. In the mm. first place, is an effective agent. But uh, as I told before, most uh, want to use cellular life genomes as natural habitat mm. to invade and to persist, and not to reproduce because host serves for reproduction, and the persistent status will also be reproduced. The perfect way of life for viruses. I thought that some viruses will infect a cell and force the cell to make many copies of it, and then they will kill the cell and then infect other cells. Yes. These are the dangerous viruses. These viruses were not able to integrate persistently, but uh, try to replicate via, via, via uh, uh, disease-causing uh, infection, and, and the cell dissolves, and the viruses spread in, within the organism and may be killed over the organism or cause a dangerous disease. But these are the rare exceptions, hmm. not the general life form of viruses. This was a strong error in biology in the last decades to think that viruses are the bad hmm. guys. And same thing with bacteria, not nearly same. all bacteria are bad. Yes. Bacteria. So we, we now have this discussion about the microbiome in the gut. In yeah. our gut, we have these bacteria which are uh, most prominent symbionts of higher cellular life forms, especially mammals and animals. And we can only digest our, what we eat and uh, metabolize if the microbiome biome in our gut is well balanced and uh, well uh, well at the whole, mm -hmm. then we feel well. So if the gut and the microbiome uh, gets out of control in our gut, every everybody of us knows what the consequences are. Well, very good. Well, Gunther, thank you for coming. And if uh, people want to learn more, how can they get in touch with you or read your books or papers? So this is all on my website. Uh, this is biocommunication.at. Okay, biocommunication.at. Yes, at uh, alpha theater. Oh, okay, a a t. Sorry, a t. Yes, the like apple tree. There are all my books, and there is an introduction in my philosophy of biology, and uh, there are all nearly all articles for download and uh, this is a good information basis. Well, very good. Good to thank you for coming. And, uh, yeah, I thank you too. I, I think an interesting talk. Yeah, definitely. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.